The advertisements are everywhere. The nutritional facts are well known. But these ads all rely on one false assumption, that we adults can actually drink milk. Today, we'll be exploring the true story of milk as it relates to the evolution of lactase persistence. Humans, like all other mammals, begin life with milk, an important food source that provides us with fat, protein, and sugar to grow. The main sugar in milk is called lactose, a disaccharide made up of two separate sugars, glucose and galactose. As infants, we have to use an enzyme called lactase that breaks up this sugar so that we can better absorb it into the bloodstream. After some time, we are weaned off of milk and our bodies stop producing lactase. The undigested lactose then continues through the digestive system to the large intestine, where bacteria in the gut ferment it and release gases like CO2 and H2. That's what causes that bloaty, gassy feeling for lactose intolerant people. Here's where things get complicated. Somewhat recently in evolution, humans evolved the ability for the lactase enzyme to persist after the weaning period. This mutation is called 13910CT, a single nucleotide polymorphism from cytosine to thymine. We call this trait lactase persistence, and people with it can continue drinking milk into adulthood without all the negative side effects. So, about 65% of the world's adults cannot properly digest lactose. These people are described as lactose malabsorbers, while a smaller fraction of them are severely intolerant. So what allowed this mutation to spread? The first hypothesis was the cultural historical hypothesis. These scientists proposed that a strong selective pressure for lactase persistence arose only in dairying communities, where milk was a dietary staple. Lactose absorbers had a large nutritional advantage, especially during times of famine. However, there's evidence that ancient dairying communities fermented their milk to cheese and yogurt, which rids it of nearly all lactose content. So that's where the theory falls apart. In this case, even lactose intolerant people can benefit nutritionally from cheese and yogurt. The next hypothesis is the calcium assimilation hypothesis which attempted to better explain the pattern of lactase persistence seen worldwide. Adults in northern latitudes, especially Europe, had extremely high proportions of the mutation. The authors proposed that lactase persistence had enhanced calcium absorption in an environment with low levels of vitamin D. To understand this more clearly, let's look at the biological mechanism. There are two different pathways of calcium absorption that we'll talk about today, the lactose pathway and the vitamin D pathway. Both occur on the so-called brush border cells that line the small intestine. So first, the lactose pathway. Calcium absorption into the brush border cell is normally prevented by a phosphate group blocking the calcium channel. Lactose is broken up by the enzyme lactase into its two monosaccharides, glucose and galactose. One monosaccharide can then bind to the phosphate group, opening the channel for calcium to enter the cell and then the bloodstream. Now let's take a look at the vitamin D pathway. Vitamin D is synthesized in the skin after exposure to ultraviolet radiation, like from the sun. It then travels into the brush border cell and activates the calcium binding protein, a transmembrane protein that can bind to free calcium in the small intestine and transport it into the cell and then into the bloodstream. So we have two pathways of calcium absorption. People at high latitudes don't get a lot of sunlight and vitamin D, so they have to use the lactose pathway to get their calcium. Therefore, there's a strong selective pressure for lactase persistence. The vitamin D pathway works for people at low latitudes who get a lot of sunlight. An important exception are the Inuit people of the Canadian Arctic. They live at high latitudes yet do not absorb lactose. That's because even with a lack of sunlight, they still get enough vitamin D through their diet, which consists almost entirely of fish. Thus, through a dietary supply of vitamin D, they are still able to absorb calcium independently of lactose. So why is calcium so important? Well, calcium deficiency is correlated with several skeletal problems, including rickets, osteoporosis, and general lethargy. Most importantly, calcium deficiency can severely impair reproductive success in women as a result of pelvic deformities, so this has a very large and direct effect on natural selection. 
So generally, there is an inverse relationship between latitude and lactase persistence, so much so that northern Europeans today are less than 5% lactose intolerant, while certain populations in Africa and Southeast Asia are virtually 100% lactose intolerant. Although the calcium assimilation hypothesis is our best guess right now, there are still some inconsistencies involving the timeline. For example, we estimate skin depigmentation to have begun evolution around 19 to 11,000 years ago, but we don't know when it exactly finished. White skin would have allowed northern Europeans to get enough vitamin D, thus negating the calcium assimilation hypothesis. We estimate lactase persistence to have evolved between 8,000 and 5,000 years ago. So depending on the true overlap of these events, the hypothesis may or may not hold up. Further archaeological and genetic evidence is needed before we can disprove the hypothesis, so for now the answer is still up in the air. So why does this even matter? Well, ignorance of genetic and geographic variants has had profound effects in recent history. It may be no surprise that American policymakers of mostly European descent are quite oblivious to the global variance in lactase persistence. In fact, throughout the 1960s and 70s, the United States sent thousands of pounds of food aid to Africa in the form of dry powdered milk. Compared to normal cow's milk, which is 4% lactose by weight, this powdered milk was 50% lactose. And remember, Africans are generally very lactose intolerant. Thus, the U.S. food aid only further dehydrated and harmed the very people that it was meant to help. Now, a little recap of what we know so far. First, we only recently evolved lactase persistence. There are two main hypotheses to account for this, the cultural historical hypothesis and the calcium assimilation hypothesis, with the latter one having more support. It states that lactase persistence is very important for calcium absorption among the people who do not get enough vitamin D. That would explain the geographic trend based on latitude. There are some inconsistencies involving the timeline of skin depigmentation and lactase persistence, and further evidence is needed before we come to a concrete conclusion. Finally, a better understanding of the traits that set us apart can better inform public health and global policy. So yes, the story of lactase persistence is the story of milk, but more broadly, it's just one example of many of the genetic and geographic variants across human beings that make us who we are.